opinions expressed on this program are those of the guests appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of 8 News Now or Next Star Media Group. We have hope now. A vaccine is coming within weeks. Tonight on Politics Now, looking for a light at the end of the tunnel. The new timeline for a COVID-19 vaccine and who gets it first. Our election is now official. The change of course from Clark County in a race decided by just 10 votes. Plus. I'm Alexandra Limon in Washington, where lawmakers continue to be stalled over a new coronavirus relief package. And one senator warns the worst of the pandemic could still be ahead of us. From 8 News Now, this is Politics Now. While Nevada faces more COVID-19 cases, there is hope on the horizon. Thank you for joining us here on Politics Now. I'm John Langler. Governor Steve Sisolak says he hopes to have the first round of vaccination doses available here by the middle of December. The state will give frontline health care workers the first possible doses and then nursing home workers. Vaccines are scheduled to be available to the public by the spring or summer of 2021. Governor Sisolak and his team say medicine from Moderna and Pfizer are about 95% effective. We have hope now. A vaccine is coming. Within weeks, we will begin distributing and giving people needle sticks. I mean, that's a positive thing. This has been done in record time. And it's our hope that we can get as much of this as we can out in the general public. We'll build more and more immunity and we can start to get back to our regular lives. The vaccine will be administered in two doses and the first available again this month. The time in between doses will be, to be either 21 or 28 days. However, coronavirus has obviously devastated Nevada's economy. New details from the Legislative Economic Forum show just how much damage has been done. Since June, the state's total gaming revenue is down 27.2%. That's $1.4 billion. In this graph, analysts project a gradual recovery over the next few years. Nevada's Gaming Control Board projects $8.7 billion in revenue for the next fiscal year. That's a drop of 11.2%. Locals tend to drive the slot machine numbers. It's table games like blackjack that are more dependent on international visitors. Many resorts on the Strip have closed hotel operations during the slow midweek days. We're having a slow period on top of the fact we don't have any events that pump up the business during that time period. NFR is gone um, for this year. Uh, New Year's, I can't imagine our New Year's is going to be anywhere near what we've experienced in the past. And then uh, January, the large, the large conventions, the, the CES, that's not happening. So I think it's going to be a challenging couple months. The live entertainment tax took the biggest hit here in Nevada, more than 99%. There were no shows. Analysts say the vaccine announcement, though, is good news for their projections of the economy moving forward. Another thing that would help in Nevada, another coronavirus relief bill. However, coronavirus cases are surging nationwide. As Alexander Limon reports, some lawmakers say the relief needs to come now. We're dealing with the corona virus pandemic, but they're also dealing with a hunger pandemic, and they have never seen anything like this. Oregon Senator Ron Wyden says Americans will likely see both the health and economic impacts of the pandemic get worse over the coming months. A tsunami of evictions, people losing their homes. That's why he and top Democrats introduced the American Worker Holiday Relief Act, which allows Americans to qualify for 26 additional weeks of unemployment benefits and extends the $600 a week federal boost through October of 2021. It also ensures freelance and gig economy workers qualify for extended benefits. For months, lawmakers have failed to reach an agreement on a new COVID relief package, in part because they can't agree on whether to extend the extra $600 a week in unemployment benefits. Larry Kudlow, director of the National Economic Council, says the White House isn't against extending unemployment benefits, but he suggests paying for it with the hundreds of billions of dollars that are left over from previous relief packages. Repurpose it back to the PPPs, the unemployment assistance, uh, school COVID related K through 12 assistance. Uh, there's some airlines. Democrats say the cost of the long-term economic relief that's needed will surpasses the amount of money that's left over. In Washington, 
Alexandra Limon. Joining us now are Washington, D.C. Bureau reporter Alexandra Limon to talk about COVID-19 relief. Uh, it does appear, Alex, there is some momentum on Capitol Hill for a compromise on some sort of a package. What are the details and is it likely to pass? That's right, and this bill comes from a group of lawmakers that call themselves the Problem Solvers Caucus. They are a group of Democrats and Republicans that strive to come up with bipartisan pieces of legislation. And in this case, they've come up with a $900 billion COVID relief bill that they say is a really good compromise between Democrats and Republicans. Some of the things that it offers is more help for small businesses via the Paycheck Protection Program, also some money for state and local governments, for airlines, and also money for COVID testing and for a vaccine distribution program. What it does not include is another round of those direct stimulus check payments to Americans. It does, however, include more money for extended unemployment insurance. And this is where the compromise part comes in. It includes $300 additional unemployment insurance a week for 18 weeks. You may remember Democrats were really set on that $600 a week number and they wanted it for at least 26 more weeks. So that's where they're compromising. And it also includes protections uh, for for businesses from COVID related lawsuits. Again, this is something Democrats that were set against that they're saying we are willing to consider this in order to get something done on COVID relief. Let's say lawmakers do reach an agreement on Capitol Hill. How quickly could it actually get passed and, and made into reality? Well, it really depends on whether they can reach an, an agreement. You know, Senator Mitch McConnell has said he will not call a bill to the floor unless he thinks that thinks that President Trump would sign it. But that's really interesting because it's different messaging than what we're hearing from White House officials like Larry Kudlow and Steven Mnuchin, for example. They've actually seemed more supportive of this compromise bill and said that the president would sign it if Mitch McConnell supported it. So if they can reach some sort of a compromise bill, uh, it's very likely that they would attach it to the budget bill that they're trying to work on. Uh, they have to get that passed by December 11th in order to try to avoid a government shutdown. So it's very likely that a COVID bill could be attached to that in order to get it passed, you know, within the next uh, few days. And that is Alexandra Limon from Washington with her dog. For the I-Team's David Charns asked Nevada Democratic Senator Catherine Cortez Masto about the potential for a relief bill and her new leadership position as the vice chair of outreach. Is this an issue in terms of Senate leadership that's holding this whole thing up or is this something else? I mean, you're you're in you're in there on the on the floor in the chamber. So what are you what are you seeing? So how the rules work in the Senate, who's ever in control, whoever the majority leader of the Senate controls what goes on the floor of the Senate for votes, whether whatever legislation, whether there can be amendments, whether there can be debates. Right now, Mitch McConnell is control of the of of the Senate. So he has controlled what goes on to the floor and he has refused to bring forward the House bills that have already passed to bring additional relief into um, our communities. And so many of us, not just Democratic senators, but some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have been demanding that we have support, bipartisan support, negotiations around another package for relief because it is so needed in our communities. It should have been done months ago. Listen, I was just home last week. Uh, I went to a, a mobile food site that Three Square has put together. There were over 350 cars in line and they started lining up at 3 a.m. There was so much food insecurity because our economy in Nevada has been devastated by this pandemic. So more relief, yes, is needed. And so that's why I support this bipartisan proposal. It gets additional relief into our communities in the next four months. That's necessary right now. Congratulations on your uh, new leadership position um, with the Democratic Party moving into the next um, Congress. Do you plan to do anything or, or does that give us or does that give, you know, Nevada a little bit of a leg up in any way in terms of what comes across uh, at the Senate? Yes, it does. And that's why I was honored to be in leadership, because my focus is Nevada first and foremost, always. And now in a leadership position, I could use my voice from Nevada to advocate for Nevadans. And so, yes, that's number one. Number two, 
um, with the transition that we have with the new administration, I'm already engaging in conversations with the transition team and, and, and moving into how we create a long-term infrastructure to continue to um, communicate with the next uh, administration uh, for needs that we have in Nevada. And so this is something that uh, I intend to capitalize on not only the leadership position, but my opportunity to really build a relationship with the new administration to focus on the needs of Nevadans. We have that entire interview available for you over at 8newsnow.com. Just look for the Politics Now tab. Coming up here on Politics Now, CCSD reverses course. It's a... A policy that you can barely read four sentences without hitting something that it gets wrong. The school district's policy on regulating free speech of employees and the strong reaction against it. And we will have a recount. The latest on the Clark County Commission race. To Smith's fresh for everyone. Welcome back to Politics Now. The closest race in our 2020 election is now official. However, there is going to be a recount. For now, Democrat Ross Miller will fill the Clark County Commission seat C, and that is because he beat Republican Stavros Anthony by 10 votes. This week, election officials in Clark County switched course and certified the vote. Now, at first, uh, they asked for a revote because of the large number of discrepancies. It was larger than the margin between the two candidates of just 10 votes. Discrepancies are things like when a person signs in to vote but fails to actually cast one. A judge ruled this week a revote wouldn't necessarily change the results. So Miller was certified as the winner. Over 150,000 people voted in this contest. It's very out of the ordinary for a, a race with that many votes to be decided by 10. <laughs> that margin of victory is very difficult to reconcile, no matter what the race is, with 215 precincts in it. On Thursday, Anthony, Stavros Anthony, said he would ask for a recount. The election staff will start working on that on Monday, and it should be finish, finished by next Friday. Also, Clark County Registrar Joe Gloria, who you just heard from, he says his office has received hundreds of calls from people who received false information about their vote not being counted. Now an update on the litigation filed by Republicans in the Trump campaign here in Nevada. Nevada Republicans have now dropped their federal lawsuit, which claimed widespread voter fraud. Now you might remember that news conference uh, two days after the election when Republicans announced this, law, uh, this lawsuit. It alleged roughly 10,000 people cast ballots, even though they don't live in Nevada anymore. They also claimed dead voters had ballots cast in their names. 
a separate state lawsuit filed by the Trump campaign trying to stop the electors from casting their votes for Joe Biden, well, that is still waiting for a ruling. Those six Democratic electors are scheduled to cast their votes for the president-elect Joe Biden on December 14th. Just before Thanksgiving, the Clark County School District posted a controversial proposal about redefining employee free speech. But as soon as it went up on the district, district's website, well, it was removed basically right after the holiday. Kristen Drummond shows us the concerns from CCSD staff and the legality of the measure. We all should be standing up. Uncertainty and unease. This is like the worst possible time for them to roll out something like this. CCSD staff and parents questioned the intention of a policy proposal removed suddenly Monday evening from the district website, a two-page document titled Employee Freedom of Speech. These are screenshots of the regulation that seems to impose restrictions on when employees can talk freely about public concerns, which includes district issues. What was the origin of proposing a regulation like this? We believe that this is someone in the district's attempt to keep um, employees from speaking up about important issues. Troubling many CCSD staff, as well as free speech attorney Ari Cohn. It's a, a policy that you can barely read four sentences without hitting something that it gets wrong. He found the document and posted a Twitter thread calling it a really bad policy drafting. I think the thing that struck me is that it seemed to, to quote language that sounded familiar from the Supreme Court cases, but the way it did it made you really wonder if the people actually read the cases. The Education Support Employees Association released a statement. It says in part, the trustees should withdraw this embarrassing and unconstitutional proposal or they will waste district dollars having a court do it for them. The Clark County Education Association tells me the union has nothing to share at this time. Kristen Drummond, 8 News Now. The ACLU says it is analyzing the document still and waiting to hear back from its own uh, free speech experts on a national level. Coming up next on Politics Now, reforming Metro Police. And so officers are dealing with, with homeless people, people who are sleeping on uh, bus stop benches. And you're right, um, social workers could fill that void. Up next, changes the police union says it will talk about at the next legislative session. Plus, who is going to lead some of the key committees in Carson City during the upcoming session? on 8 News Now. You're watching Politics Now. 
In November, our I-Team did a week-long series on police reform and what has changed here in the last year. Some of that includes hiring and firing practices and use of force policies. Now, after that series, our George Knapp interviewed former district attorney and a current police union attorney, Doug Rod, David Roger, I beg your pardon. We talked about what would happen in the upcoming legislature. Uh, so much unrest over the summer, so much anger around the country, state legislatures, city governments. We're looking at a variety of police reform options. The Nevada legislature uh, included. You went to the legislature uh, to present uh, some options uh, from the PPA. What was the reception? Uh, we got the stiff arm from, from the Nevada legislature. You know, uh, a year earlier, the Nevada legislature uh, passed a Peace Officers Bill of Rights. Uh, these are procedural rights that uh, officers have during internal investigations. Um, Twelve months later, uh, the Nevada legislature wiped all of that, that out. And, uh, you know, we felt, I felt uh, that it was a knee-jerk reaction. You know, um, they, had, they had six months before, six, seven months before the 2021 legislature. Uh, there was time to, for hearings and uh, discussion about the changes, and uh, they wiped it out in, in a matter of two days. And, and I felt that that was uh, unfair to the officers and very unfortunate. Just a reaction to the political environment, the pressure. You know, what we found uh, was that uh, this was a vocal minority that was pushing uh, all of these changes. And, and it was a national national discussion. Uh, but, you know, I, I believe, and uh, there's uh, some empirical data that the people of Clark County uh, believe in their police officers. They don't want to defund the police officers. And uh, although they may not agree with uh, every um, every incident uh, or every policy that the sheriff enacts, they have a great deal of faith in, in their police department. And uh, I, I just thought that the legislature played to the vocal minority. Is there a way forward where we can de-escalate de the involvement of officers in certain situations mentally ill, um, maybe redirect some money, and that uh, resolves a lot of these concerns, or not? Well, I, I don't want to redirect the sheriff's money because uh, he, he knows uh, uh, where, where the money should be spent. Uh, but, you know, we, we have a homeless issue in, in Clark County. Uh, officer, when there's a problem, people call the police because they don't know who else to call. And so officers are dealing with homeless people, people who are sleeping on uh, bus stop benches. And you're right, um, I, social workers could fill that void. Are there any other reforms that you, your members, your officers in PPA would, would uh, support or have in mind? You know, I, I think that as an organization, uh, you know, Metro Police officers are always looking at cutting edge uh, policies and tactics and, and training. They love to train, they don't have enough time to, to train, uh, but they are always willing to improve. Uh, what uh, they, some are not inclined to be is uh, the pinata, to be beat on by the legislature when you know, we are, we've gotten the stamp of approval from the Department of Justice. You can watch the entire interview and our series on police reform over at 8newsnow.com. Just look for the Politics Now page and the State of Metro banner. You'll get the information you want to look for. Coming up on Politics Now, who will be in charge of the committees in Carson City on those reform bills and who will have to make it go through?
Nevada Republican Congressman Mark Amaday says he has expressed interest in running for governor in 2022. I don't think it's news to anybody, but they think that Governor Sisolak in, in some ways has made himself vulnerable for re-election. I'm sure he doesn't agree with that, and I'm not going to be disrespectful, but it's like, so, so there's a lot of people kicking tires right now, and we're certainly going to kick our share of them here in the near future. Amaday made those comments during the Metro Chamber of Commerce Eggs and Issues Breakfast this week. Amaday holds the Congressional District 2 seat up in northern Nevada right now. Other Republicans whose, name have been, whose names have been mentioned for a potential gubernatorial run, one of them, former Senator Dean Heller. We are only a few months away from the 2021 legislative session in Carson City. This week, assembly committee assignments were announced, so let's take a look at them. And of course, with Democrats in control, they're going to chair all of the committees up there. First, we'll look at, well, the wallets, the money. Ways and Means will once again be chaired by Maggie Carlton with Daniel Monroe Moreno as the vice chair. The Revenue Committee will be chaired by Leslie Cohen and Teresa Benitez Thompson is the vice chair. With police reform on the agenda, the Judiciary Committee could have some of the key bills going through there, and it'll be headed once again by Steve Yeager. Rochelle Nguyen will serve as the vice chair. Education, always a top subject in Carson City, and that committee will be headed by Shannon Bilbray Axelrod. Brittany Miller is the vice chair. Bilbray Axelrod is, the, is new to the Education Committee. We'll have the latest on the legislative session moving forward. Have a good rest of your weekend.